even as I come to the realization that nothing in this world can pierce the hopelessness that ruins every stimulus I could still come upon, I find a reliable sense of wonder when imagining how patient it has been. Its origins, its creation, its nature, and its effects. This always makes me shudder with a palpable sense of despair, mixed with awe at my strange fate. I've regressed into sympathizing with it, into turning to its titanic lack of mercy in all-encompassing designs. In order to feel anything is the only real thing, I guess. The only thing with the purpose left in it. I used to be a studier of mimetic theories, advanced sociology with specialization in all things information technology. I'd written some well-respected studies on general behavior on the internet, the spread of ideas, and the way people communicate depending on the subject matter, like two girls, one cup, but with more analysis, detachment, and looking at how quickly things get attention and how it is related to man's creation of culture. I decided to turn towards outliers next, the fringes and the corners of the internet's lost information. Now, I scoured for obscure P2Ps and used extensive programs to make my investigations go faster. I simply looked for anything forgotten, useless, half-cooked, unique, empty, lonely, or downright useless on the internet. I figured it could become a book, a study, or a decent hobby. When I found it, there was one thing that called to my attention, the channel name. I was using any and all ways to access any kind of irk there was, trying to see what stood out. Where I saw it, I have long since forgotten. But what I saw exactly was what I was looking for. The name of the channel was skewed at an angle rather than a smooth line of text with a designated box. Rather than text, it was designated by a symbol and not the kind available through any unique code or script I knew of. Yet, upon examination of the site's code, there was nothing indicating an image rather than a script. In fact, there was nothing indicating that the channel could even exist. The script didn't allow for more than a few channels, and the one with the symbol made too many. The next day, I took my hard drive to the garage and then prepared to hook up my spare with my trusty screen and keyboard. Upon connecting, I noticed something that made my face lock and prickly moisture formed underneath my eyelids. Letters, arrows, and other symbols on the keyboard had been usurped, absorbed, eaten. The symbol had taken every spot on the screen frame. The name Phillips had been replaced with a row of seven symbols. A bag of snacks laying on my desk had met the same change, and only the symbols could be read. Stunned as I was, my mind didn't take to work until I accidentally glanced at my watch and saw that I was late. The more profane, sheltered part of my brain won me over, declaring the whole thing an impressive prank designed by a pair of friends noted for their odd humor and knowledge of my new hobby. It even assured me that they had made the snack bag simply to test their commitment. I took the bag and everything affected along with the hard drive and with the flash of instinct, I threw them into the rocky ditch on my way to work. Work went easily, and a quick phone call to my girlfriend, who usually lived with me but was on a conference, assured me that she would be home soon. Eager to hear of the amazing joke the infamous Miss Pear had pulled this time, by lunch I had made up my mind for takeout and drove to a sandwich diner. I entered, placed myself in line, opening a newspaper laying abandoned on a nearby table, surveying the menu. I decided upon something grilled, and then 
felt the visual equivalent of a sucker punch as I saw that symbol sitting innocently in place of the word mayonis. With what must have been unsettling concern, I asked the person behind me whether he saw the symbol on the menu. I can't recall the person's gender, but I do remember the look. It was as if my question broke a spell. The face of the person twitched as if I had jumbled its mind to mush just by asking. The twitching hastily stopped and was replaced with a look of the most complete lack of understanding. All this apparently unremarkable to the person in the closest line who had seen the whole thing. I rounded on the cashier, asking for my order, and with a deep sense of foreboding, asked for some mayonnaise on the side. Her young frame made a strange, quivery motion that seemed to involve every single muscle. And then she just simply looked at me, her face normal, save for an awkward lack of understanding. As if I had asked for something with a foreign name, or at least a kind of condiment she had never heard of, I waved my demand away, took my order, and by now forgetting any sense of inhibition or proper behavior, bolted out of the place. I rushed for the first deli I saw, looking in every aisle, drawing worried and disapproving glances as I surveyed every square inch for mayonnaise, asking every shopper I met whether they knew what mayonnaise was, only to be given the same dumb stare, and when I did happen upon the place where mayonnaise should be found, the shelves were stacked with small statues featuring the symbol in perfect gray stone upon a small gray dish. Remarking upon this to the nearest shopper created the same spasms followed by a look I myself have given to those asking for something in a foreign tongue. I directed their gaze towards the symbols, and then I watched in fascinated horror as the spasms overtook them, only to leave them turning their gaze away, looking towards me with a look of inquiry, suggesting my request had been completely unintelligible. The memory of seeing the symbols had glanced off, or perhaps been received and then forgotten, maybe even erased the instant that they were seen. To this day, I wonder how, even as I spend most of my time whispering, why I found a bookstore, scoured dictionaries for the word, only to find the haunting symbol in every copy. Cookbooks showed the same replacement, even in recipes where no real substitutes for mayonnaise could exist, and where the dish would suffer. I knew by now that this was no prank or unique hallucination on my part. Reaction. A curious look, a moment of silence, and then a continuation as if nothing had happened. I felt a growing sense of desperation as I struggled to find someone who could acknowledge the symbol's presence and its impact on language and reality. In my last bid for sanity, I asked the first person I came across to indulge me by reading a recipe out loud. He tentatively took the book, shot me a curious look, and read the list of ingredients. I had no real sense of hope, but I did feel my mind jettison all its notions of reality and convictions about the paranormal when he started to have uncontrollable spasms, the minutes that he was to pronounce the symbol, only to proceed with the next ingredient as if nothing had happened. I asked him what you get if you mix egg yolks with vegetable oil, vinegar, salt, mustard, and pepper. He simply said, well, that sounds as it would taste funny but good. 
still eyeing me with a mix of amusement and suspicion. You get mayonnaise, I said, and the spasms overtook him. He angled his head as if he had not heard me and then said, I'm sorry. I dropped my shoulders and said, you get KZV, a Russian paste, make it fluffy. KZ, well, it sounds tasty with tuna. By the time I had come home, I was deathly nervous. Having bought a dictionary and looking patiently through it with a permanent film of sweat upon me, I scrutinized every page. I trembled at the thought of what effects the symbols could create next. A knocking at the door interrupted my anxious research. I left the dictionary open on my desk and opened the door, only to find my living girlfriend beaming back at me, her eyebrows stuck between concern and amusement at my no doubt harried air. I explained myself as having come back from a jog and embraced her happily. She responded in kind and I hoped to brush over the spreading sense of being at the mercy of the symbol by asking her about her journey while I prepared her some dinner, having recently read of the dangers of Redma and its many tasty byproducts. Our household was swearing by chicken, and I was preparing some fajitas for us. While she detailed the conference, she, or was an employee at a company, selling risk assessment for other companies interested in investing in third world countries. Apparently, the war launched by New Carthage had not sustained critical problems due to poor citizens and the remains of the Ottoman combine. The place was now quickly being invaded, not by troops sent there to kill their dictator, but rather people hoping to make a buck and to gain a footing the conference would mean her company had busy days in the future. I asked her about the journey back as I placed pieces of chicken breast in my special marinade. I could still remember the global sounds as her body repelled the word normal. It grew at an exponential rate after that. Time and time again, I showed my girlfriend the symbol that had taken the place of normal in the dictionary, on the internet, in writing, and presumably in speech. And every time, she would have the same small par rock isms, only to ask me to look at what, exasperated as well, worried about my frightened weeping. I tried to keep her with me for as long as possible. I wanted her comfort and humanity while I still could. Yet, at the same time, Watching her represent the same deconstruction, all other humans felt tore at me so badly, I could barely keep a straight face, not even to make her happy. It was like watching an amputee keep on working, as if the amputated part had never been there, working around the absence as well as she could, only to spasm and forget as soon as her mind turned to the thing that would have been there before the symbol, that is. But it wasn't just the word. It was its very substance, meaning concept and form that was replaced. Things the humans of my dimension dictated to be statues turned into those brooding gray effigies. One day, then the other day, the word nails was gone, and buildings collapsed in mass, while my girlfriend, along with all other humans, had her fingertips covered with the symbol. I stayed with her until the day I awoke, only to see a pair of symbols where her eyes should have been. She flailed for me as I left. She wasn't in panic. She didn't even remember that she once could see. She just saw darkness but she remembered that I used to be with her. And now, I was not. I strangled her. I mean, really. What else could I have done compared to what met the others? It was mercy. Even before everything thought to be eyes was exchanged with the symbol, people had been rendered pathetic 
and unstable by the unfelt absence of the words, like strong, pyramid, particle, yes, any imaginable word disappeared only to leave the symbol. I guess the words as well as what they represented disappeared. Soon, the night sky had an enormous symbol instead of the moon. And naturally, the tides became erratic, flooding and blinding people who lived by the shores, even as they fought starvation, trying their best to talk between themselves, trying to understand why it was they could not see things. As for a cruel play, humans lost the concept of sight and vision weeks after their eyes became replaced with the symbol. Now, of course, soon dehydration and hunger killed those not dead of accidents, and I was glad that their mouths disappeared as quickly as they did, freeing me from hearing their broken pleas for help. I watched in a mixture of complete sorrow and detachment as skyscrapers, lampposts, trees, dogs, cats, and so on, turned into gray symbol statuettes of varying sizes. But why did it leave me? Why do I have a field around me in which I could store whatever foodstuffs I've been able to find before it was replaced? Maybe it sought to play with me, punish me, or even thank me in its own little way. It matters not as I write this last part on paper with a pen, successfully managed to keep in my little pocket of safety and meaning. Most of the elements in the earth and its crust have turned into the inert and nameless element the symbol is and represents. Perhaps this cancerous element is made up of countless smaller symbols. I do not know. The Earth's magnetic field is waning, and soon all will cook unless the stars and our sun, with it, turns to titanic symbols. Before that, of course, perhaps my entire universe will turn into one great symbol, piece by piece. It has, after all, sought to cover every element, concept, and whatever else comes to mind. It will become everything soon. Perhaps it is lonely, the symbol. Perhaps my message will come across your dimension once I've given up. Perhaps it will not. All I know is that I've remained safe. And while the ruination of my universe does not stir any emotion within me, the thought of the symbol enveloping another dimension, or all of them like a tumor, fills me with dread, even while nothing else can. As I conclude this chronicle, my existence stands within the dwindling sanctuary of symbols, a pocket of safety amidst the relentless transformation of my universe. The symbol, an insidious force, has claimed every facet of my reality turning once vibrant elements into inert statues of its essence. The world, my fellow beings, and even the very ground beneath my feet succumbed to its relentless advance. In this desolate landscape, my isolation is both a curse and a dubious blessing. I remain untouched, a solitary witness to the universal decay orchestrated by the symbol's unfathomable motives. The very air crackles with the impending demise of my dimension. As the Earth's magnetic field weakens and celestial bodies teeter on the brink of symbolic metamorphosis, the dread that envelopes me is not for my imminent demise, but for the potential spread of this cosmic contagion to other dimensions. I pen these final words, unsure if my message will traverse the boundaries between dimensions. Whether it does or not, I offer this testimony as a warning to any other existence that may bear witness. Beware the symbol, 
as my universe crumbles and the last vestiges of familiarity succumb to the symbol's pervasive influence, I grapple with the haunting possibility that my isolated haven will soon crumble. The closing chapters of my reality are etched in symbols. A cosmic finale that echoes the silent void left in the wake of eradicated words, concepts, and forms. In the throes of this inexorable transformation, I cling to the remnants of my humanity, wondering if my final thoughts will echo across the cosmic expanse. Even in the face of apathy towards my own demise, the prospect of the symbol spreading its malevolence to other dimensions lingers as a harbinger of unrelenting dread. Perhaps in the void that awaits, my words will find resonance beyond the confines of my existence. May they serve as a cautionary tale for those who encounter the symbol. A silent witness to the unraveling of one universe and a foreboding specter of what might befall others. <laughs>